Welcome to Atmospheric Tales, a podcast that amplifies stories and experiences related to air pollution and climate change from around the world. I'm your host Shahzad Ghani and welcome to another episode of Atmospheric Tales. Our interview for this episode is Dr. Langley Dewitt. She is an atmospheric chemist with a global focus. She has worked on climate change and air quality issues in the United States, France and Rwanda. Her work has encompassed both academic research and air monitoring consulting for industry clients. Our guest is a climate journalist and activist based in Sudan. She is the Middle East and North Africa or MENA program manager at Climate Tracker, an international organization that empowers young climate communicators. She works mainly on training environmental activists in the MENA region on climate change communication and climate policies. I'm excited to welcome our guest, Lena Yasin. Welcome to the show, Lena and Langley. Thanks so much. Um, I'm excited to hear more about Lena's work. All right, Lena, you work for Climate Tracker. And Climate Tracker's goal since its inception in 2015 has been to train young journalists in climate science reporting through mentorships, fellowships, and international in-person training. When did you first become involved in Climate Tracker? And how has that involvement evolved over time? Thank you, Langley. So I first got involved with Climate Tracker in 2016. Uh, I was 18 at the time and I was writing about climate change. Like I was publishing some articles about climate change, but I wasn't reaching a wider audience and I was barely able to communicate the message properly. So I thought that I needed help to like advance my, love, my skills. And I came across an online mentorship program offered by Climate Tracker. So I signed up and I got selected. And then I received three months or three, or three to four months of mentorship where they trained me more about climate communications, how to write about climate topics, how to uh, convert the complex climate data to simple topics that people can actually understand. And they also taught me about the basics of journalism. How can I, how can I structure an article, how to come up with an idea and how to pitch my article and get it published. Uh, within a couple of weeks of training, I managed to publish my first article in a, in a major news newspaper in the country and I was really proud of that and I think after that uh, I kept publishing more and more and I kept reaching um, new audiences and publishing in newspapers Uh, so after that like after the mentorship ended I think they were also proud of my progress and they invited me to join their team in Morocco in COP22 which is the annual climate conference where countries discuss the climate negotiations I went with them to Morocco and I would describe that as, uh, that experience as a life-changing experience because uh, I've always written, like, uh, like at that time I was writing about climate change and how we as countries need to get together and figure out a solution to climate change and we need to tackle it together. But going there and seeing the actual process of discussing climate uh, change and the climate negotiations was amazing like I finally got to see what I was writing about and I think that kind of changed how I look at climate change and how how I even communicate it. I was also the only climate reporter from my country there so that kind of also felt like a responsibility so I had to cover the progress of the negotiations, make sure that I'm writing articles that people can understand and people are interested in. And a while after the conference, they invited me to help them expand their work in the Middle East and North Africa region because they wanted to expand their work in Arabic. And I got to work with them as a staff member. And here I am, I guess. Oh, that's awesome. And sort of related to that, you write in both English and in Arabic for Climate Checker. How important is it to communicate about climate and local languages that you found? And what have you seen gained by reporting in both English and a local language or Arabic, which is not quite local? Um, well, I think the fact that I am able to like uh, communicate in Arabic and English uh, is kind of a privilege because uh, not a lot of people have access to both languages. So I'm mm-hmm. kind of aware of my privilege. But I also feel like that fact kind of puts on some responsibility on me because the major studies, I would say, and the research is available now online are just uh, mostly in English. So if anyone wants to know about climate change and they don't know English, I think the level of information that they can get is very limited. So I think me as someone who calls myself a climate communicator, I need to actually make sure that I'm taking those information and converting it to my language, to um, to my language, so that people in my community and my country can actually understand it. So I think it's very important that I use this privilege in order to help others and in order to raise awareness. Uh, but I also feel like speaking English is not just 
it doesn't have to just me converting information to my community, but also me putting my community out, out there. So I'm kind of like a bridge that works both ways. So I can write articles in English where I can highlight the experience of my country uh, on climate change and the struggle that we go through to the international community and can put my country on the international news media. So I think uh, it is important and it is a responsibility for everyone who speaks um, more than one language and that they can convert those information to their native language and make sure that they are helping their community become more aware about climate change and what's out there really. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and you sort of have a unique perspective in that you live in Sudan and you cover the MENA or Middle East and North Africa region. So out of curiosity, what's the perception of climate change in Sudan for the general population? And how does that fit into the MENA region as a general region? Well, I think I would say that the level of climate awareness in Sudan is extremely low. And that's mm. because um, people in the country like have more challenges that are keeping their brains occupied, I would say. So, like people are worried about like, like the country right now is going, a major, is going into a major economical crisis. So people yeah. are worried about like their daily income, like education, health and so on. So I don't think climate change is something that comes to their mind easily. And I don't, I re, like I personally don't blame anyone in Sudan who doesn't sense the urgency of climate change because they have more important, like I wouldn't call it more important stuff, but stuff that touched them um, directly to worry about. I would rather blame the government for not working more on climate policies and making sure that the country is adapting uh, adapting better to climate change. And that also like the same perception fits to the MENA region. Like so the MENA region is a busy region. Like there's always a war about to break out in that region. So journalists in that region are also more interested and more tempted to cover war and politics rather than environmental and climate topics. So and this is why we in Climate Tracker um, focus, um, like have a lot of projects going on in the region because we believe that journalists don't get the intersection between climate change and other topics. Like climate change is a cross-cutting topic. And if they can finally get that, I think they can include some climate elements in their reporting. So that's why uh, in the middle region, we have a lot of projects going on where we train journalists about climate change, but we also try to explain to them how they can keep doing their reporting while including some climate elements in order to raise awareness. Because mm. essentially what we want people to do is we want them to become aware of what, does, what, what is at stake for them because of climate change and how they can push their governments to do better. So I think that's why, like, if you want to compare, like, the climate movements uh, in the world, you would see that the West is more vocal when it comes to climate issues. And that's because I think they have the privilege to focus on how to make their life better because they, they have access to, like, basic life necessities. But while people in Sudan and many other developing countries have to worry about how their income and, uh, like, basic necessities. So I would say, like, even climate advocacy is a privilege that not everyone can access. And that's why we need to raise awareness. And as journalists and communicators, we need to help people become more aware of it and become more aware of how they can push their government to do better. Great. And that answer is a part of my next question. So that's perfect. I guess there's been some research that shows, though, that extreme weather events, such as, you know, large scale floods, which have happened in Sudan recently, have been tied to climate change, as has reduced rainfall in the growing season. So you could sort of see those as really uh, pressing issues as opposed to climate change, which could be a problem to be addressed later, but they're tied together. With that in mind, from your perspective, are there any insights that you can share on how to get local support for climate change actions sort of in a region without a lot of resources or a post-conflict region? Well, I think you're definitely right about the concept of later. Like a lot of people, uh, not just in Sudan, but many developing countries, when you, when you talk to them about climate change, they would say that, yes, it, it sounds like an important topic, but let's, like, let's worry about the economy first and then like focus on climate change and again that they say this because they're not aware of like the, the intersection between climate change and economical um, and economy basically so I think I mentioned that we need government to focus especially governments in the de in developing countries to try and focus because we're, we're the ones on the first line when it comes to climate impacts and the climate urgency uh, and we are already getting hit harder than most people so we need we already need to start adopting better climate policies and we need to learn how to live with climate change basically like we can't 
like it's a reality that is happening already and we need to learn how to live with it. So I think mm -hmm. we definitely need governments to put more effort, but that that's not going to happen alone. Like uh, that's, that's alone not enough. And we need, we also need to make sure that we have community initiatives that are focused on climate change and climate adaptation. And I think in order for this initiative to happen, people need to be aware of the issue first and aware of how, how it affects them. So like I would say, a farmer in Sudan is probably already aware that his land is his land is struggling and that his his like his crops are not producing as much um, and that's because of certification. But what I'm sure of is that the farmer is not aware of how is this linked to climate change. So if I want to um, convince a farmer that he or she needs to pressure the government into adopting better climate policies or like working on more climate resilient crops, I need to explain to them that climate change is an issue that affects them and that climate change is basically linked to desertification, which is hurting their land and their income. So I think getting that local support is possible. But what we need mm -hmm. to focus on, we need to focus on making the issue relatable to them and explaining things in very simple terms uh, in a way that can get people motivated to join the movement. Yeah, that all makes sense. Get it to be a perspective that they understand. Um, and sort of related to that, Climate Tracker trains local climate journalists like you, which amplifies local perspectives on climate change. And that's really essential, I think, as climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies must be adapted to local context for the success of any climate change regulations. In addition to, you know, reporting and communication, is there anything else you think that can be done to pull in more local perspectives for these climate change policies? Yeah, I, uh, I think one of the main things that journalists and reporters uh, miss when they're covering climate change is that they don't focus much on reporting on the indigenous knowledge already available. So you would see that Western media, especially when they report on climate change, uh, like they usually portray it, uh, like especially like in Africa, they usually portray the country as a struggling nation that is dying and so on. People are not dying, like they're, they're there. So like, they have found a way to adapt to climate change and live with it. So I think it's really important to take that indigenous knowledge, what they've learned and how they've learned to live, to live with climate change and get it across to the, to the world, like show the world how people are, are already dealing with climate change and what they've learned throughout history, like how they have managed to develop this, those techniques on how to, like, how to deal with climate change and how to deal with heavy rains. In Sudan, for example, like uh, farmers in certain areas have uh, this technique that they use to predict rain. And it's, it's been efficient for, like, I would say hundreds of years. They can predict rain and they can know when, when rain is going to hit hard or not. And therefore, they can shift their uh, agricultural methods um, based on that. So this is something that they've learned because they, they had to adapt to climate change and the change in weather. So, uh, But you rarely see reporters covering that. What they like to cover is that farmers are struggling, they're losing their income and they're dying. And that's it. Like this, the, the narrative that is being used is really sad. I think this is kind of ruining um, the main message and there are more important messages to cover. Yeah, I agree. And another question that relates to that I was thinking from the importance of local perspective. When I worked in Rwanda, I heard a lot of scientists not from Rwanda want to do indoor air quality studies on kitchen ventilation in Rwanda, which to me was a little bit ridiculous because most people in Rwanda cook outside, so they don't really need a ventilated kitchen. So it seems like a lot of you know scientists and articles written about climate change include Africa or the MENA region, but they don't have you know, an African perspective um, or a local context, or they suggest climate mitigation without understanding the local culture or infrastructure, which means that those like mitigation regulations would not necessarily be as effective as they could be. Can you maybe go more into this disconnect? And do you have any specific examples? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, the example that you're giving about Rwanda is uh, like it's the perfect example of how um, when a cover, like when a topic is being covered by someone who's outside the community or the country, uh, it's usually viewed from a different angle, and that angle doesn't necessarily fit with the reality on the ground. I can give you another example uh, of a project that, like, I wasn't working with, but like an organization that I know. 
that were working on a project uh, in a certain area. It was a very easy project. All they had to do is they had to come to the village, install uh, solar pumps to help because females mm-hmm. in that village, they had to work, uh, I think, about around three hours every day to have access to water. And in order to help them, in order to reduce that amount, they installed solar pumps right next to the village so they don't have to work that, that, that amount anymore. Two months later, the same uh, organization came to do like a follow-up and check on the progress of the project. And they found that all the pumps that they have uh, installed have been deliberately broke, uh, like destroyed. Mm. And after conducting an investigation, they found that those pumps were actually destroyed by the, by the woman in the village, like the same mm. woman that they were trying to help. And that's because apparently the three hours where the woman have to work and get water was the only three hours of socializing time they get every day to like gossip with each other or talk about life stuff and so on. And once that three hours were taken out of the day, all like they were forced by their husbands or you say family to stay home and not go out. And for them, like the three hours walk was actually something fun and they didn't want that to disappear from their daily routine. So they had to like, they decided to just destroy the pumps. And I would say that's a perfect example when you decide on a project without consulting someone who knows the community or without speaking to the community first and know what actually works and what not. And this is, and this is exactly what Western media usually tend to do. They just tend to report on anything that looks like news, but they don't report on realities on the ground. And I usually like to call this lazy journalism. Like they just want something that people can click and read but they don't really want to use their platforms to get important message across, to make people more aware, or to even show people how they can help. So if you're like, for example, if you're reporting on a country experiencing floods because of climate change and that people are dying, the least thing you can do is you can show your reader how they can support, how they can help and so on. But I think some medias are more focused on getting views and reads rather than actually helping climate change and so on. That's a good story. I like the story <laughs> about the, <laughs> the village. I would be sad if my three hours of uh, gossiping were taken away. But right. Definitely. <laughs> um, related to how you frame your journalism in a context to be more relatable to people in your area, um, the care of the planet and preventing human suffering, you know, is considered important by many religious beliefs. And in this context, many religious leaders have started discussing the seriousness of climate change as it is affecting people and the planet. Uh, You have written about climate change in the context of Islam. And what do you think is gained by doing this? What could be lost without adding such cultural context to climate journalism? Uh, Well, the first time I ever thought about including some Islamic perspectives in climate articles or even writing an article linking climate change to Islam was because I remember I received the feedback from someone on one of the articles that I wrote. And that person told me that um, because in Islam, we have this understanding that whatever happens is a plan from God and we should not question it and we should just be patient. So what Mm -hmm. he said to me, he said that this is the same thing. So like climate change is a test from God and we should not be questioning it or like trying to fix it. And this is when I thought about, wow, so if people think that way and like that person represented the typical Sudanese person. So probably anyone who reads my article thinks that way. So and therefore I'm not really reaching anyone. So what I started doing is I started reading more about the link between climate change and Islam. And in Islam, we actually have we have a specific verse that, that says God put us on earth to protect it. And mm. therefore, I started using that verse to say that right now we're not protecting earth. So we're not really following God's orders and we're destroying it. So that same, that same person who, who gave me that feedback on my article was convinced and started actually to, to actually talk more about climate change in their own platforms. So I think for me now, that's how I managed to actually reach people. So like a lot of people in Sudan think that way. And if I can't make it relevant to them and relevant to their culture, please, um, I think I'm speaking to no one. Like I'm just putting words on papers that no one would probably read or be convinced about. So I think mm. it's very important to consider culture, uh, context and beliefs when you're writing about not just climate change, but anything. Like if you want to keep, like if you want to impact your reader, you need to think about how they think, how they believe and what what is important for them. So you need to speak to them directly. Yeah, I can really see that. It's true. And it's great you found a way to reach more people in a context they understand. And sort of in addition to bringing climate change awareness to people in your region, 
I think it's also important for people in your region to interact with the you know, larger climate community. But a lot of conferences, climate conferences take place in the global north, and there can be barriers for people to enter the conferences or enter that community. And um, what kind of barriers have you or your colleagues had in accessing that global climate network? And has it affected yours or their work in any way? Oh yeah, I've, I've been rejected. Like uh, my visas have been rejected multiple times, like especially by the US. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but yeah, uh, th- this is actually uh, one of the major issues that I think activists in the global South face, uh, because mm-hmm. uh, as you said, like those conferences usually happen in the global North, and that's because they have like the capacity for it. Uh, but then we don't we don't really have equality when it comes to accessing countries like and borders. So like mm-hmm. for for example, um, one time I got selected to attend the first UN Climate uh, Action Summit in New York. That was, I think, September last year. And mm. like the UN decided, like they chose, uh, I think, around 100 activists from all over the world. And they like, they send us invitations. So I was like, honestly, that like really felt like uh, a life changing experience. And I was so happy to actually receive global rec- recognition, me and another friend. So like we were going together to represent Sudan there. And um, we did not make it eventually because uh, we didn't get a visa appointment. Like we tried to reach the embassy in several ways and we never got an appointment. Uh, While my other colleagues who are from the West um, easily made it there and without any struggle or visa stress. So you could see how even when it comes to climate advocacy, we're not equal. And like um, people in the global south struggle more and go through yeah. more challenges just to be equal, even when it comes to advocacy. So I think that kind of limits the impact of our work. And like I would say that conference was critical because uh, it was meant the activists who were chosen were meant to work with the UN on a, like a global climate action plan. And no mm-hmm. one from Sudan made it. So I would say like there was no voice from Sudan there. So my country missed that. And yeah, that's that's one example. Yeah, I think it's a big struggle that really needs to be addressed since climate change is a global issue and all voices need to be heard. What importance do you kind of give large climate conferences and global climate agreements like the COPPER, the Paris Climate Agreement, sort of as compared to more regional climate agreements, maybe like a MENA specific reduction and adaptation strategy? I mean, obviously, most of the emissions are coming from the global north. So that's a mitigation issue that needs to be addressed globally, but adaptation strategies perhaps could be regional. Do you have a feeling on the relative importance? Well, I think the global conferences like the COP, they're important because that's the only way to get all countries together to actually agree on climate commitments. And I think they're important because the only way for us to solve climate change or at least to like win and win this fight is to work together. And that's why and like we already seen like major countries like the US uh, trying to pull out of uh, Paris Agreement. It's important now more than ever that we need to stick together and and we need to continue this effort in order to make sure that the global temperature doesn't increase above 1.5. I'm sure you've heard of the IPCC report and you've seen ha- mm-hmm. like those scenarios that could happen if we see that, uh, that yeah. level. So like, like a lot of countries, like a lot of people are going to die and a lot of countries are going to lose um, countries are going to be to disappear. So I think those global climate um, negotiations are our only chance to actually get things together and to fix this, like to fix what we've ruined. So that's why I feel like if you go there, if you like, if you go to the COP, like uh, uh, last year, I, I was part of the COP twenty five. It was in uh, in Madrid, in Spain, and mm-hmm. I went for the first time as a junior negotiator. So I was like selected by my country to attend the conference. Uh, as a negotiator, and I was I was part like I was part of the rooms where they discuss like specific parts of the agreements and how and they try to agree on it. If you go and see the process, it's just a it's a very complicated process and it's very slow. Like I'm I'm an activist, so going there and seeing how slow that process is just made me more frustrated. Like uh, <laughs> no, seriously, like uh, at some point yeah, I I get it. in the meeting, uh, I remember thinking that 
if the future, like if my fate is is in with those people's hand, we're, we're screwed. Like, I don't think there's a way for us to fix this. But then again, what you see is you see young people, like on the same day, there was the global climate protest. Uh, it was a Friday. And I think thousands, hundreds of thousands of kids were protesting climate change. And they even managed to take over the main negotiation room and scream at negotiators. So that that's, that is the kind of push that we need, and that is why those agreements um, are important, because if we don't get a space where countries can actually negotiate and stick together, there's never going to be like a way for us to fix this. And mm-hmm. regarding the regional climate agreements, I'm not sure that's... Like, I'm not sure that's a th- that's an effective thing because uh, the problem with climate change generally is that each country wants to put the blame the blame on someone. So, like, developing countries want to blame developed countries histor- because historically they, they, fa- they caused climate change. And that's why they mm-hmm. think that they should be the ones um, to fix it. And I think that's completely wrong. I mean, yes, they, they caused climate change, but we're, we're, we're in this together. And if it doesn't fix, if it doesn't get fixed, we are going to get hurt first. And that's why we need to work together. And yeah, that's why I think uh, regional climate agreements, uh, I wouldn't say that like they're as important as global ones, global ones where we get actual commitments. Now that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think I agree. And is it great that you were able to see the climate negotiations and the energy of the young protesters um, while well, you yourself were pretty young? And you also got started with your climate activism really young. In 2013, Sudan was hit by one of the worst floods and you were only 15 years old, right? Yeah. And you did volunteer work to help your city recover. And that's sort of what got you started about writing about climate change. What tips can you give young journalists like you that are getting started in environmental journalism? Well, I think that volunteering experience was like was it, it really did change my perspective of life, and it, that's it's, it's the reason why I became like a climate advocate. So I think what I would say to any young climate activist or journalist is that once you get into the climate change work, you will find that it's overwhelming, especially that if especially if you read more about it and if you read the reports about the worst case scenarios and where we're heading, it can be overwhelming and at some point you can feel like this is like this is unfixable and there's no hope. But I want them to know is that their actions matter, like their voice matters and any work that they do will make a change. So I think I would say that don't be overwhelmed and know that you matter, your actions matter and you can make a change. Well, thanks so much for talking with me, Lena. I really appreciate it. And I think I've learned a whole lot from your perspective, which is great. No, absolutely. I enjoyed this very much. With that, I would like to thank our guest, Lena Yasin, and our interviewer, Langley DeWitt, for joining us on this episode of Atmospheric Tales. Please reach out to us via email or our social media channels to suggest topics, guests, or to be an interviewer on one of our episodes. Our contact information can be found on our website, atmosphericTales.com. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and suggest questions for our upcoming episodes. Thanks to all our listeners for tuning in. Make sure to subscribe and share.